<laughs> wow. Did you get that on CD and recording? I want that to be sent to every church I go to in the future. That's the nicest introduction I ever had. Wow. Look at, look at this. This is amazing what God is doing here. This is incredible. I'd forgotten about those voices. I think that was an advantage of having multiple personality disorder. <laughs> what a surreal moment. Last week, I was the youngest Paul Bear. Uh, holding on to Pastor Tom Whitten's casket, and this week I get to come to something that's so new and so fresh. It just blows my mind. And I uh, get to work with Doug Shell again. 30 years ago, he was my worship leader for the youth ministry, and you would just run around. It's, it's, I want to talk about perspective, and I want to talk about perception, and that's a, this is an appropriate time to do that. You remember last year, our perception and our perspective was so different than it is today about about coronavirus. I mean, am I the only guy last year that was in my driveway washing my groceries for an hour and a half before I brought them in? <laughs> what are you doing, Joe? Hey, Bill, washing the beans. What are you doing? I'm washing the carrots? All right. And, you know, now I'm licking handrails and escalators, you know. <laughs> I just don't care anymore. <laughs> Last time, you know, uh, you go into a restaurant, it says you forgot your mask and you run like a stalking vulture back to your car, begging God to protect your life. Now you see it and you remember. And look, you find one on the ground. Here, this one. I don't put this one on. Yeah, I don't care. Things have changed. So many people in this audience I know that I love so much, like family, former students like Betsy, former uh, students in this place, my own administrative assistant, Jennifer. Boy, this really puts a lot of pressure on me. Normally, if I lay an egg, I go on to the next city. I have to see y'all. Man, it's great to be here. I want to talk to you about perspective and about perception, and I'm not cool with a little mini iPad. I have one. I'm just too lazy to plug it in, so I got an old music stand, if that's all right. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to the book of uh, of uh, Matthew chapter 16. I just wrote this for you. I, I hate to read sermons. I like to preach them a couple times, memorize them, and go on, but I just wrote this for you all uh, this week. It's been on my heart pretty heavy, and some will be tied to this just a little bit. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, if you don't have a friend in Jesus, if you don't know that your name is written in that Lamb's Book of Life, just in the city where I live in Kannapolis, just today, uh, somebody at a convenience store lost their lives through some various circumstance. I'm not aware of all the circumstances, but just like that, in a moment, our lives could be gone. Do you know that your name is registered? Do you know if, God forbid, you stop breathing today that to be absent from this body, you'd be, you'd be walking on streets of gold? If you don't know that, this book says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And there's no judge in this room. Only Jesus can judge our hearts. We just tell the good news. He's crazy about you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you like the apple of his eye. If he had a refrigerator in heaven, he'd have your picture right there on. And I'm telling you, he's crazy about you. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to deal with the sin problem. And all we've got to do to come to the Lord is come like a little kid, you know. I, I was in a Multiply Church years ago, and the lady says, come here, Pastor Joe, I want to, I want to introduce you to my grandson, a little three-year-old grandkid. He says, this is Pastor Joe. Hi. Tell Pastor Joe what you did last night. What? Picked his nose, picked his seat, you know, like little kids do. Don't tell him what you did. Oh, I asked Jesus in my heart. I like cake. And I thought, that's perfect. That's exactly how we come to God. Like a little kid. I asked Jesus in my heart, I like cake. My, my own uh, five-year-old grandson yesterday, I went down to his sister's birthday party, and, and uh, we were in the kitchen. <clears throat> and he, he said, Pop, Jesus really loves us, doesn't he? I said, he sure does, buddy. He, he really he cares about us. That's, what, that's the words he used. He cares about us, doesn't he? I said, he does care about us. And he said several other things like that. I said, what did you learn about that? I watched your movie. You said it on your movie. Precious. I'm telling you, <laughs> anything I do this year, that right there, that, that's going to mean so much compared to everything. But that's, that's how we come to the Lord. So if you're away from God a million miles or 100 feet, you'll have an opportunity about 35 minutes to make it right, like a little kid. 
You know, Jesus said to the guy on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't have time to crawl off and get baptized or none of that. He just came to him as he was. And I love walking with Jesus. He's my best friend. COVID can't change that. I've never regretted for a day walking with the Lord. Matthew 16, God, thank you for your presence in this room. Thank you for all my dear friends. If I start naming them, I'd be in trouble because so many in this room mean so much to me in various and different ways and so much history in my own life. And Cecilia, who's watching online, and Lauren, not feeling well watching online, and, and, and my whole family, God. I love this family. I love the, the shells. I love this church and being a part of this exciting moment. Thank you for that. So what do we do here, Lord? We earnestly desire spiritual gifts according to your word, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Eagerly and earnestly desire the spiritual gift of prophecy. Let me say what you want to say to these people, God. Any other gift that we need, healing, miracles, the gift of faith, whatever it is, God, and especially the gift of evangelism. If there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior before they go to bed tonight and put their head on the pillow, let them know that they know that they know that their name is registered in heaven because they've received you. To as many as received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God, John 1, 12. And so we trust you for these things now, Lord. We'll leave you for a great, great, great night in every way. Thank you for your powerful presence we experienced during this worship. Mm. Do your thing, Lord. Do your thing in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I tell this story with permission. It happened in Lakeland, Florida, 1989. My little boy, who's a preacher, like uh, Pastor Wesley, he, he, he was a one-year-old. He was in a crib. It was on Memorial Boulevard at the Holiday Inn across from the Poe Folks Cafeteria. It was in February of the year. Wasn't even a year old, 11 months. We'd had our little youth event down there, and we were sleeping in on a Saturday. And I woke up to the sound of my wife praying, and I say this with permission, by the way. And I thought to myself, I have married so good. I have a godly wife. She is praying, even in her sleep. How spectacular. And she got a little bit louder, and I'm like, all right. She's a Pentecostal prayer. <laughs> and then she got for real Pentecostal, and she started speaking in tongues. And I'm kind of moved about this till she got so loud it started creeping me out. And I shook her. I shook her like this. I shook her. I said, hey, wake up, baby. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, baby. Wake up. And the harder I shook her, oh, the louder she got. Now I'm really freaking out. She's having a full-blown episode somehow or another. And so she started pointing as she's praying into the corner. She's pointing into the corner like that. And I said, do you see something in the corner? She never let up on the, she kept her foot on the prayer accelerator. And she just started shaking her head like that, shaking her head. I jump up, turn all the lights on. I say, what do you see? She never contacts in. Of course, she was, she was asleep. She, she thought she saw a man standing in the corner by the crib of Joseph holding a rifle. In her mind, it was as real as the rent. But what was hanging on that shelf there, on that hanging uh, closet, was a soup bag and the strap was, was, was just hanging there, like a, almost like somebody standing there holding a, a weapon or something. If you put that woman on a lie detector and said, did you see a man standing in your room holding a rifle? She would have said yes, and she would have passed because that perception was so powerful. I'm going to talk to you for a moment post-Easter now, two weeks, on perceptions and uh, perspective, how we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus. This is, this is new in there. I'm going to tell you already, all you English people, there's already a typo in it, and it's not Nick's fault. It's my fault. So, Jennifer, make a note when you see the, the typo. All right. <laughs> Who is Jesus? All right. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Perception. It's very, very close to perspective, but it's distinct. 
Here's the definition of perspective. The state of existing in space before the eye. The state of one's ideas, the facts known to one. Synonyms of perspective include attitude, mindset, and viewpoint. It seems very, very close to perception, but they're diff different and distinct. Here is the definition of perception. The act or faculty of perceiving or apprehending by means of the senses or of the mind, cognition, understanding, insight, intuition, discernment. Who is Jesus? Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Synonyms include awareness, the concept, feeling, impression, opinion, sense, or a thought. I won't read it all like this, but I want to get, <coughs> excuse me, I want to get this nailed down. Perception is what you interpret, the ability to see, to hear, or become aware of something through the senses, the state of being or processing of something through the, those senses. It's not about one thing. It's about a mix of attitudes and values that you have an insight into. It's what you, it's what you interpret. It's, it's the understanding. Now, perspective is your point of view. So I'm going to give you a an example. I've spent the last couple of weeks, probably why I have this summer cold, cutting down trees in my backyard. I never felt like more of a man in my life than that chainsaw. It was battery powered. It was about two volts, but I still, <laughs> it's three clicks up from a Tonka toy, but I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> and I've just been working out there. And yesterday I saw out one of my windows in my house, my neighbor, my new neighbor down there on, on the property line. She's She's doing this right here to her daughter, and she's doing this. And immediately, my perception of that situation was, I have encroached on her property. I don't know my, my property line, I suppose. Maybe I cut down something that was precious to her. Now I'm in trouble. That was my, that was my perception, which changed my perspective of my relationship. Now in my relationship, I've got to do some fence building. I'm thinking through this thing, through the night, even in my sleep, I've got to call a surveyor. I've got to get somebody out here. Maybe I should bring them some brownies if you have any extra. My, I've got all this perspective going. My. So today, out there on the deck, in my private time with the Lord, I see the, I see the neighbors. And I'm like, I've got to go start building fences. And I walk down there. And I said, hey, Paul, how are you doing? And here she comes. Oh, boy, get ready. Strap in. Here we go. And here come the gestures from this lady again. She gets up to me, and she says, she says, this is unbelievable. You have really made this property beautiful. Way to go, Joe. <laughs> so my perception formed my perspective, which forms your values and your beliefs, which ultimately forms your destiny. But it was not the truth. It was just my perception, you see. Just my perception. Pauline Moore, a veteran and a, of the U.S. military and a certified John Maxwell speaker, says of this, she says, in reality, it is the perception of our reality that controls our perspective. Our perspectives comes from our perceptions. Our perceptions come created from our beliefs. So first comes the perception. Jesus asked the disciples in the text, what are people's perceptions of me? Who, what is your perception of me? What is your perspective of me? So I, I just wanted to come to a few encounters with Jesus and see what people thought about him, what their immediate perception was, what, what the perspective from that came. So first we look at, we look at the, the scripture from Mark chapter 6. Verse 45, immediately Jesus and his, made his disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. And while he sent the multitude away, verse 46, when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain and pray. And when the evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and, and Jesus was alone on the land. He saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He would have passed them by when they saw Jesus walking on the sea. They supposed it was his ghost, and they cried out. For well, they all saw him, and they were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he went up into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed at themselves beyond measure and marvel, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Interestingly, I, I went to a, my junior year of high school in Decatur, Alabama, in fact, I saw a guy at Multiply Main Campus this morning with an Alabama hat on. I said, roll tide. I said, well, hey, that's what my wife says. We always have a conflict one day a year. 
of therapy on that particular day. One of us is in the fetal position, one of us cheering one day, one day a year. So I say to the guy, where are you from? And he says, uh, he's from Madison. I said, I used to go to Madison to buy my alcohol because I lived in Decatur, and it was the largest dry county in the city. This was before the days of following Jesus. And uh, we got to talking a little bit. And I remember that when I was in Decatur, Alabama, my junior year, I wrote a term paper. You could pick any topic you wanted. I wasn't a follower of Jesus, but I picked this passage right here in my bibliography. And I wrote a, to- I wrote a paper on poltergeists and ghosts. And to many, many people, that's exactly what Jesus is. They perceive him as something. The disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. They knew that there was something there, but they perceived him as a ghost. Not the Holy Ghost, but a ghost, a poltergeist or something like that. This is a society that really does believe in supernatural stuff. One pastor says, I don't want to spook people. I don't want to spook people by emphasizing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It makes them, it scares them. I said, have you looked at television lately? (laughs) They got shows about zombies. They got shows about plane wrecks called Manifest, and they're having special revelations or whatever, callings or stuff like that. I was in Georgia and preaching, and I I saw it was in August, and there was a bunch of people in this little central Georgia town, and they were all clumped up little groups of people all over town and there was one guy in the middle holding a a, a stick with barbed wire on it and I, I, I said to the pastor what am I looking at what are these people doing this is where they filmed the walking dead <laughs> right here and it was as creepy as it could be well this is what the perception was from these Jesus people that Jesus wasn't Jesus but that he was just a ghost People are looking for supernatural stuff. They may not be look, looking for Jesus, but they're looking for supernatural stuff. They see, they see uh, uh, f- Jesus' face in an overpass and line up for hours, and his face in a grilled cheese sandwich, and then he'd sell it for a million dollars, you know. The picture is crying. They're looking for supernatural things, and that's what happened here. In a land clamoring for the supernatural, These men see Jesus, and their perception is he is simply a ghost. So we're going to look at these three words for each of these encounters. Pressure, perception, and perspective. Pressure, perception, and perspective. Because pressure changes our perception. It forms our perception. What was the pressure here? Jesus sent them away without him. Got some abandonment issues a little bit. They don't have the boss or the leader. That's a little bit of a pressure right there. And then the Bible says they were straining. Have we strained in the last year or so? There was a straining. There was a struggle with the, with the waves. That was a pressure. Circumstances were against them. That was a pressure. It was an inconvenient time, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., the fourth watch. That was a pressure, 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 pressure. Fear and terror because of the waves. Terrified. Absolutely terrified. Just like in the book of John where they were locked away for fear of the Jews. Pressure forms our perception. And what was the perception? Ah, it's just a ghost. It's just a ghost. And what was the perspective? The result of their perception was they were troubled. They were troubled. The way we perceive things causes a reaction. Let's look at the second one. This is a gardener, John chapter 20. But Mary stood outside the tomb and weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked at the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Now, this is this misspelled word, and I misspelled it, not, not ne- gardener has an E in it. Gardener, the gardener was just a necessary, low-level functionary in society. He has to be there, or else the weeds grow up. But he's not necessarily a guy that we are going to invite to the party. 
And that's how some people perceive Jesus today. He's just a lower level functionary. We've, we've heard the people that say prayers and we, we wonder in our minds, not trying to judge, do they, do they even know Jesus? You know, they even know how to, to talk to Jesus. They've never met Jesus. He's just, just part of the fabric of society, one of many low-level functionaries. It's a reality. He's real, but not that important. So what is the pressure? Grief and weeping. That's the pressure. That's the pressure. Grief causes a tremendous pressure. And, and I, I don't make light of corona and COVID. We know people have died. We know people have almost died. My daughter struggled for 190 days with, with uh, this extended COVID long hauler symptom stuff. I understand the reality of it is not to make, when I do comedy about it, it's not about the disease. It's about some of the crazy stuff surrounding, some of the behavioral stuff. But grief is a real thing, and it causes us to change our perspective and our perception. The Bible says, and godly men mourned greatly for Stephen. Grief is something that grips you. Even with Pastor Tom's passing, and, and uh, I loved him like a father. I catch myself sometimes even a little bit breathless. And I wasn't even really in his family. Some of you have lost people. And that grief is real, and it's heavy, and it is a pressure and it is a godly thing to grieve. Godly men mourn greatly for Stephen, Acts chapter 8, verse 2. But you have to protect your perceptions when you're in grief or else it can spiral out of control. And this woman was grieving. She was grieving, grieving. Now that, the perception was that Jesus is just a gardener, just a gardener. I was a little intimidated to preach in front of J. Mark because he's a theologian. I, ha I had his job teaching Bible at the school he's at. He te teaches theology. I just told stories about boogers and stuff like that. <laughs> I went w one year for, for about 10 days, every person that came into that Bible class, they would knock on the door like that. A and I thought to myself, man, these southern kids are polite. I mean, these are the nicest. I mean, they co they're coming into a Bible class and they're knocking on the door. I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, hey, so... But after about nine days of that, it started getting on my nerves real bad. Till one day I look up, and Sabrina was walking in. I just happened to catch right as she's walking in the door. This will show you I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, I can promise you. When I looked up and Sabrina was coming in the door, she didn't knock. Well, actually, she, she did knock. And I said, Sabrina, why did you knock? She said, Pastor Joe, I didn't knock. I didn't knock on the door. And I'm still looking at her. And the next kid comes in, and the door closer was broken. Every time somebody came in, it was knocking on itself. But my perception was that these North Carolina kids are real door knockers. <laughs> now, now, that's silly, but there are people that have perceptions that of big, big things that seep into their DNA, that affect their lives. That is not the truth. You shall know the perception, and the perception says, no, no, no. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not the perception. You're just a lower-level functionary. I, 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 just want, I, just, I just don't need you, gardener. And then, then the perspective changes when he says, Mary, Mary. And what, so the pressure is grief. The perception is you're a gardener. The perspective, the perspective from that relationship was ignorance. I don't know where they laid him. That's, that's one of the things that happens to us. Ignorance is not a bad thing. It means we don't know. I don't know where they put Jesus. And if you put him somewhere, Tell me and I'll go get him. Accusation. See, we have the wrong perception. It causes us to accuse people. Our perceptions affect everybody around us. Then we've got another one here. It's, it's not a ghost or a gardener. It's just a guy. John 21 is my favorite. My favorite. After these things, verse 1, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin. Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to him, I'm going fishing. 
And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out, and immediately they got in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. When the morning now had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Just a guy. It's not a ghost. It's not a gardener. It's just a guy standing there. Now, Bishop T.D. Jakes, who's a lot smarter than me, he says, I was working out listening to a sermon a few years ago. He was preaching on this passage. You're looking at me saying, you work out, keep your thoughts to yourself. That hurts my feelings. And, he, and Bishop says, when Simon Peter stood up and said, we're going to go fishing, it was the same as saying, I'm going on an all-night bender. I'm going to go get drunk because he wasn't supposed to fish. He was called to fish for men. But now he's going back to his default setting, which we all do. We go back to our default setting. I'm, on, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go fish. And that was as rebellious as saying, I'm going you know, to clubbing all night or whatever. Cheating on my wife, whatever. Same thing. But notice what the other disciples did. Peter says, I'm going fishing. They didn't say, nah, we are, sh we are supposed to wait and tarry for power from on high. Do not do this, Peter. They said, you going, dog? We're going too. And they fished all night, but they caught no fishes. Fished all night. I mean, they got blanked. They got blanked. I want to go fishing. I'm under spiritual conviction to go fishing. I haven't fished in about 15 years. I hope I remember how. I ain't trying to fish at night. I, I used to live in the Midwest. I was born in Indiana. grew up in the cornfields. And when we came to Lumpkin, Georgia one year, my grandmother had bought, sold the farm in Indiana and bought a 50-acre lake full of stumps and crocodiles or alligators and water moccasins. But to a 10-year-old kid, it might as well have been the Nile River and crocodiles and piranha. My uncle and my dad would go fishing. They said, Joey, we're going fishing all night. You want to go? Let me think about it. No, I'm going to eat sandwiches and live. Y'all go out there and stumpy alligators. And so they went out and they, they fished all night. They got nothing. And there's a man. There's just a guy standing there. He's just a guy. Cast your net on the other side. And now if you know anything about Simon Peter, he wasn't real compliant. Oh, the man on shore said we should cast our net on the other side. Brilliant. It's a terrific idea. No, I, in my head it went like this. Cast your net on. Oh, that guy thinks he knows everything? Well, shut his mouth. We're professional fishermen. We've been out here all night. See about this. 157 fish. 157 fish. Went from zero to 157 in just a few seconds. Even Peter, as blustery as he is, knew he wasn't that good. The guy started changing, see. The perception was just a man. Just a man. 157 fish. People, commentators say different things about that. Just let me say this parenthetically. Cyril says 157 uh, represents the 157 known varieties of fish on the earth, representing all of people. Jerome says, no, uh, uh, says uh, 157, 100 was for the uh, uh, Jews, 50 was for the Gentiles, and 3 was for the Trinity. And you know somebody has preached this in the hills and hollers of West Virginia. He said, throw your net on the right side because right-wing politics is right and the left. Somebody has said that somewhere on this earth. How about he's just not really a guy, but he's above a guy, and he knows where all the fish are. That's, but the perception formed, formed that perspective. It's just a guy. The pressure, the, what was the pressure? They were filled with dis and dees. They were disillusioned. They were depressed. They were discouraged. Jesus said he was going to usher in the kingdom. They're, they're despondent. They're, they're frustrated. Two steps forward, three steps back. I'm going fishing, and that's not really God. That's just a guy until they drag in the fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved named John. Now, you can look at that any way you want to. You read that, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that he must be arrogant. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> or he must be really humble. I'm not even going to give my name. I'm just a dude that 
that Jesus loved. That's all I am. However you want to interpret it, that guy leans down and says, it's the Lord. And then the perception meets reality. And it's not just Jesus, but it's God. It's not a ghost. It's not a gardener. It's not a guy, but it is God. And when that happens, when those things converge, then life changes dramatically. Verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, it says it's the Lord, and he jumps in and swims to Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? He's making breakfast for him. Now let this blow your theological mind. They're doing something they're not even supposed to do, and Jesus lets them be successful at that to reveal that their perceptions can be exploded and the truth can settle in their heart. So the pressure that they had of discouragement, the perception they had, now it's God. What's the, what's the perspective of their life now? Total restoration. Here's Simon Peter who said, I don't care what these jokers do. I love you more than all them. I'll never, ever deny you. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Joseph Peter swims up into the shore. He's the first one to Jesus. And he said, this ain't a guy. This is God. And God is making breakfast for this backslider. There's only two places in the Bible where there's a charcoal fire. The first is where Peter is warming his hands and denying the Lord. He says to a little middle school girl, he got intimidated by a middle school girl after 15 years of youth ministry. I promise I know how that feels. <laughs> They'll eviscerate you. They'll make you cry. Go home to your mother. Hey, I know you. You, you are with Jesus. Shut up. I don't know him. Cuss, cuss, and curse. Now what does he have on the shore? As he's, as, he's, as he's dragging himself up on that shore, does he remember this is exactly the scenario where he called me a few years ago not to fish for fish, but fish for men, and now there's fish on. What is happening right now? Right back to a charcoal fire. Total restoration. When his perception changes, this is not who I thought it was. Who do you say that he is? I wrote this little poem, if I can remember it, on a Delta napkin, and I'm coming to a close here shortly. Trust me. It's called Tainted. And I, I, I'm not usually bent towards restoration, especially in ministry, you know, ministers, whatever. But, man, it was just something exploded in my heart on that flight many years ago to Orlando. It goes something like this. Out of the ashes of a devastated soul through the smoke-clearing vistas of sinful toll, Steps a preacher, steps a Christian, written off long ago, publicly disgraced for his prodigal show. He landed on a heap of Christians tainted. His sin was broadcast and the faithful fainted. No one gets a pass from this nebulous shadow. How's he even standing in this infamous meadow? Settling in a sediment of black despair, barely could the Christian gasp hope's sweet air, but a voice settled with him. Though he could barely hear it, the whisper of one dwelling with a contrite spirit and the voice said, stand. Grace has come for you and grace has brought life, the way and the truth. By faith, he took one step on broken reputations and each step that followed brought kind confirmation. Like Samson is in, the glory has returned. Redemption is delivered to a man once spurned, walking back to a ministry Though not the same, chiseled to simplicity by despair and shame, the Christian now humbled walks out from the ashamed. God's mercy has reclothed him, and he has been renamed. Outcast he is no longer, for he has been rescued. A minister once more, a man for God to use. So when your perception changes, friends, you start hitting a moving sidewalk with the Lord. So what is he to you? Josh McDowell says he's a liar. A lunatic or Lord of all. He's either, he's, either, he's either a ghost, just a mystical thing, some low-level functionary we got to put up with, or he's not even real, or he is God. So I, I conclude and ask you, who do men say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? I've got a personal policy that when, uh, 
I see a dead animal on the road when I travel these thousands of miles. I do not look because I get sick at my stomach seeing all that innards. Sorry. <laughs> can't do it. Can't can do it. Now, my, my wife's fascinated. I wonder, that's the small intestine. Look at that. Nope, 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 nope. So I saw a dead animal on the road last week. I saw a dead animal. I know. I focus on the road and make sure I'm not going to run over it. I'm focusing on the road, and then I, the animal flies up at me, which kind of creeped me out until I realized it wasn't no animal. It looked exactly like a dead animal. It was just a cardboard box and a figure of an animal. <laughs> See, perception is not always truth. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a low-level functionary? Is he a mystical something or other? Just a guy, not really real. I was, uh, I don't recommend this, but I was looking at a comedian on a, on a clip on the internet. I like to study the craft, and this guy's brilliant. He's funnier than me, definitely richer. And he said, uh, he's an atheist, famous atheist. He says, if I ever had the chance to interview God, which is not real, but if I did, I'd ask him one question. I'd say, why don't you kill Satan? And he would look at me and say, shut up. No, he wouldn't. Not like a little kid. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't have to answer. But to every question that I have, why did you take my loved one so soon? To the questions that I have, why did my 92-year-old just plow through Corona and giggle at it like a speed bump, but my 29-year-old still suffers from it? Every question that I have, where is uh, Cain's wife or whatever those theological questions, well, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Every answer is not shut up. It's these two words, empty tomb. Empty tomb. The cross is important. A lot of people set themselves on fire and blow themselves up for causes. The cross is extraordinarily important, of course. But, the empty, but, but a lot of people can die for a cause, but nobody could resurrect themselves from the dead. That was God. Empty tomb. Empty tomb. This message applies to a lot of different things. I'm settling on Jesus, but I, I remember a few years ago in a church in Georgia, I preached in, I'd been a youth pastor of that church for five years, a long time ago, and I saw this woman talking to the pastor's wife in the back, and the pastor's wife was gesturing for her to go, go, go on, go on up there. She comes up, and she said, can I talk to you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, do you remember me? I said, I'm sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I see a lot of people. Do you remember I called you? Well, tell me more. I called you, and I asked you to visit my son because he was suicidal. Yeah, and your secretary said that you would never do that. And the next day, the next day killed himself. I said, dear lady, when did this happen? She said, 21 years ago. I said, ma'am, I said, things get under the radar in my life. Jennifer can tell you that. Things get under the radar, and I, I miss stuff that's important. But I don't miss that kind of stuff. I've driven six hours to be with somebody in the hospital before their 6 a.m. surgery. I don't miss that kind of stuff. She said, I know. It didn't sound like your heart at all when you preached. I think maybe we got that wrong. My husband died last year. We both, we both hated you for 21 years. You see how perception will cause you to go down a road that God never intended you to go down? But revelation now, see. Revelation. It's his ghost. He gets in the boat. No, it's not a ghost. It's God. It's, you're the gardener. Tell me where you laid him. Mary. Rabbi night. It's God. It's just a guy on the shore giving us fishing tips. Wait a minute. That's God making my breakfast. All these uh, former youth of this old guy have heard this testimony before and and I'm going to close with this and give you an opportunity. I wish I could say I came to the Lord in a beautiful church like this. I came to the Lord on a, on a discotheque floor. Long story, but my math teacher started taking an interest in me. He saved my life. If you ever find out his name, his name is in every one of my passwords. You can get in any of my bank accounts. 
See where all eleven dollars and all my coloring books are stored. I love him. I owe him a debt I can never pay. He carried me to his farm in Opelika, Alabama, and worked me like a Hebrew slave for a turkey bloney sandwich, an RC cola, a faded banana, and a ten dollar bill. And I'd take that ten dollar bill and I'd sneak into the smugglers inn in Columbus, Georgia. And I would dance with a fake ID. I did that for about seven weeks to farm. See, but then one day, he, he cheated. He said, well, won't you come up here tomorrow and go to church with us? I said, Mr. Reader, I ain't really, I ain't really religious, but I appreciate it. He said, now, if you do that, Pat, Patricia going to make some homemade fried chicken, some butter beans, homemade cornbread, banana pudding, make you slap your mom. It's so good. I said, what kind of religion are you? I could be Nazarene for pudding. I'd be Presbyterian. I'd, whatever you need. I got you covered. Yeah, I'll be back. And I'd been, see, to me, Jesus was just a ghost. All the way back to my research paper. He was just a low-level functionary. I didn't really believe in him. This man, as a Baptist man, took me to a Pentecostal church on the hill. And, and the old-timers remember the choirs that all had robes. I'd never seen anything like that. I walked in, and they, all these dudes and women wearing the same kind of dress. They had their eyes closed. They were all waving at me. I didn't know none of them. I'm like, hey, how y'all doing? These folks are nice. Instead of passing an offering plate, I'd been in church half a dozen at a time, dated a Baptist preacher's daughter in high school just to go on a date with her. That was a mistake on her part. So anyway, I, and they passed a plate. But in this, they had a bag. I'm looking for juicy fruit. I didn't know anything about anything. I was just poor. I was so poor, I'd go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, lick other people's fingers. I'm telling you, I was broke down, man. I was broke with no hope, zero. And that church was, I felt something. I mean, somebody starts speaking Swahili. I'm like, can we leave? Oh, chicken. That's right, chicken. I know there was something in that room. It's just a man standing on the shore to me. I didn't, I didn't know. So then in another seven weeks we go. We go uh, work at the farm, nightclub, go to church. Work at the farm, nightclub, go to church. One night I was... <laughs> Moving to the grooving. That doesn't really flow with whatever you got going on there. <laughs> I was listening to Cool and the Gang and Rick James, and I remember I was dancing with the married lady. I remember that vividly. And he stopped being the gardener in that moment. On that floor. I like to go back to that place sometimes because now it's a Longhorns restaurant. Much better use of the, the space. I heard a voice, louder than a voice, say to me, Joe, I love you. Joe, I love you. I got something better for you than this. And I, I stopped dancing and I started weeping. Still, still gets me. And the, and the jarheads or the, the guys from the military base, I couldn't hear them because the speakers were so loud, but they were, I could read their mouths. He's drunk. I was too poor to be drunk, man. I hadn't even had a drink. I had heard the voice of God. The epiphany came, and he stopped being a ghost, and he stopped being a guy, and he stopped being a functionary part of society. And in that moment, he became God to me. Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I walked out of the darkness that night, and I walked into the light.